Yo. Welcome everyone to part 5 of the Creepypasta Iceberg by the one and only Fried Pickle Boy. Let's jump right into it. My goodness, look at that. Molten pasta sauce. We must be getting awfully close to the pit of pasta by now. I know it looks like lava, but trust me, nothing is as it seems here. There is no logic or rhyme or reason to nearly any of it. Still, uh, trade carefully. You wouldn't want to get that creepy pasta juice in your shoes now, would you? Before you know it, you'll be writing the next Mario the Killer.exe, the Ritual of Lovecraft inspired Monsters Lost Episodes Curse. Or something like that. Ronald? McDonald House. Starting this next tier off, we have yet another one that was very famous at the time, but I don't really hear anyone talk about these days. The story starts with the following, quote, I'm sure you've heard of the Ronald McDonald House charity. They provide housing for families of sick kids when they're in the hospital. Seems pretty innocent, right? Well, there's another sign to the charity. There's another type of Ronald McDonald House, one that not many people know about. There's one in most big cities. You won't find it by looking for it. It doesn't have an address. It doesn't have a sign above the door. It doesn't even have windows. No, the only way you'll find it is if you're taken there. That's how I found it, unquote. The story then follows our narrator, a 15-year-old boy who is an orphan, and a bad kid who has been jumping in and out of homes for some time now. This has left his caseworker with only two options. Either he goes to military school in Lansing, or the Ronald McDonald House, which is the last place left to clear him for acceptance. He decides to go to the Ronald McDonald House, but things don't go very well, like, at all. Quote, well, we're here. The car came to a stop. I looked out the window. We had parked in front of a tall, gray, windowless building, sandwiched between two other industrial buildings on a narrow city street. I noticed that there was an address on the building to my left, and one on the right, but none on this particular building, not even a sign. Are you sure? I asked, hesitating as I opened the car door and climbed out of the back seat. I slung my backpack over my shoulder, clinging tightly to the strap, and followed the caseworker up to the windowless metal doors. She pressed a buzzer and spoke to someone inside, and the doors clicked to unlock, and we walked in. As soon as the metal doors closed behind us, I noticed the pin drop silence. It was that sort of silence that was so oppressive and empty, it almost deafens you. Across the dimly lit lobby, there was a glass window with someone inside, a secretary. She was turned away, typing something intently. We walked over to the window. The caseworker rang a bell on the counter, and the secretary spun around in her chair. Her face was painted like a clown, like Ronald McDonald, in fact. She even sort of had curly red hair. Otherwise, she wore a typical white nurse's dress. I wanted to laugh at how bizarre it was, but I couldn't. A chill swept down my spine. Something just wasn't right. I watched as the nurse and my caseworker interacted. Paperwork was passed through the window. The caseworker slid my case file under the glass as the nurse slid her some papers to sign. As my caseworker signed the papers, the nurse looked at me. Her smile seemed to have been warm and welcoming, but... All I saw was her eyes, and in her eyes was 
hunger. Unquote. Well, he of course is forced to stay here, and then almost immediately after he is, well, cast off here, he is surrounded by a group of clown makeup wearing adults who grab him, strap him down to a bed, and start laughing as they flash knives, saws, and needles all around his face. It really goes from 1 to 100 very quickly, until he eventually blacks out. He then wakes up in a dingy cell in nothing but a filthy hospital gown, the sound of screams in the distance. The only other thing in the room, besides a small drain in the corner of the room was his backpack. He unzips it and finds inside a photo album. Quote, I wearily opened the photo album, but instead of the photos that had been in there, photos of myself with my previous foster families, photos where I had attempted to look happy and hopeful even though I knew I wouldn't be there for long, instead of those photos, they were like crime scene photos. And in each one, I recognized one of my former foster families, brutally murdered and covered in blood. My heart raced as my stomach churned. I began to turn the pages quicker. Each page a new photo, a new family, new carnage. I recognized their faces and the inside of their homes. I had lived with all these people, and now they were all dead. I came to the last few pages, a photo of my house at night, then a window of that house, then inside the house, a dark hallway with light coming from one doorway, then a photo of my caseworker brushing her teeth at her bathroom mirror, then a photo of her looking at the camera in horror, then a photo of the caseworker naked, covered in her own blood, contorted into an unnatural position in her bathtub. I turned to the last page. Written inside the back cover of the photo album were three words. You never existed. Unquote. After this terrifying incident, our narrator manages to pick the lock on his door open and then tries to escape the facility. Along the way, he finds a large room where the other orphans that were taken here are all crucified, tubes stuck into their arms and sucking the blood out of them and into this large, loud device. Just as he says, what the fuck, alarms start blaring and a group of clowns start chasing after him into the basement level of the facility where rotting corpses reside. He runs with all his might until he reaches a ladder and climbs up. There's scalpels cutting at his legs until he's able to open the manhole out and then shut it back again, catching his breath. But where he is, he couldn't tell. It was all abandoned streets, broken glass, no lights, no cars, nothing. Until, quote, Then I saw a light in the distance. It was a big yellow M in the sky. A McDonald's. Of course, I limped towards it. When I came to the McDonald's, I saw that apart from the M, the rest of the building was completely dark. I walked cautiously towards the broken windows and looked in. Darkness. I turned and surveyed the Play Place outdoor playground. Ten foot tall structures of colored tubes for kids to crawl through. Sitting at one of the benches was a familiar figure, the Ronald McDonald statue. You know. The one where you could sit beside him and it looks like he's got his arm around your shoulders. Every kid has seen it. I shuddered at the sight. The doors were unlocked. I walked in out of the rain. Silence. Darkness. I noticed that the decor wasn't like the modern McDonald's you see. It was still the same as it was in the 80s. With the white plastic booths and the red and yellow tiles. The wind seemed to whisper through the broken windows. I noticed something on the front counter. A black rectangle. I got closer. A laptop. A nearly new laptop. I let out a soft, <laughs> delirious laugh. I knew what I was supposed to do. So I took the laptop outside and sat beside the Ronald statue. I opened the laptop and began to type this story. The rain is falling on the keys, but I don't care. There's nothing left to do now but wait, because I've been noticing, out of the corner of my eye, Ronald is trying to look over my shoulder. He's laughing now. <laughs> All I can do is join him. 
unquote. And that's the story of the Ronald McDonald House. And it's all right, even though this whole story is way outside the realm of reality and is very over the top. I do still think it has a couple of fairly suspenseful scenes, all things considered. With my main issue with the story actually being that I think there could have been a far slower dip into the insanity of the story proper. It's a story that had it been done a different way, say the place was more normal at first, and slowly things got more and more uncomfortable, uh, the dark secrets slowly being revealed, I think it would have been a lot better. Plus we could have had time to see some of the other orphans, maybe our main character becomes friends with some of them, enemies with others, before they all start going missing one by one by one. Maybe the whole idea of the very few people he does know, you know, like the other foster families and his caseworker having been killed, could have been done more slowly. The employees of the establishment gaslighting him into making them seem crazy that he was ever part of these other foster families and eventually even his caretaker until slowly his entire identity is erased. Really play with that whole orphan and lack of identity angle. Uh, but as it stands, it's not bad. It would make for a pretty decent horror game, I guess all things considered. Though the whole kids being crucified and their blood going to some giant device was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of, it kind of took me out of it a little bit because it's like, okay, well, why are they doing that? What, what What is that about? And it's never really explained, so that's a little whatever. But while we're on the topic of clowns, the clown, the paint, and the turbines. This one's pretty short and follows our narrator who's just a little kid who's moved into a new house next to a large field full of wind turbines. Since he's just a kid and his parents are often at work, he has lots of time left alone in the day to just sort of explore and play in the new giant house in the field. Though the only two things he was told not to do is to never go into his parents' bedroom and to never approach the figure in the field. Well, this being a creepypasta, the kid, of course, eventually goes deep into the field and approaches said figure. One which looked like a scarecrow from afar, but was in fact a clown. When the kid asks who the clown is, he responds with, Your worst nightmare, and proceeds to talk as if the kid's mother was aware of him or something like that. And so then the kid runs back into his house, the clown not far behind him. And then eventually he wonders if there's some sort of connection with the clown and his parents' bedroom. And he then goes into his parents' bedroom, only to find that his dad is hanging from the ceiling, hooks in his back, and the words sacrifice are scrawled all across the walls. And then the clown comes up from behind the kid and knocks him out with a paint bucket. The kid then wakes up in his bed, thinking it must have all been a bad dream, which the author strangely notes, quote, this seems like a stupid plot twist, doesn't it? It's not. Please keep reading. You have to find out the truth, which is just, um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a little immersion breaking to say the least, but okay. But anyway, the kid then walks outside looking for his parents and sees someone waving back at him in the distance of the field. He, for some reason, thinks that this is indeed his parents and decides to go back inside and watch cartoons for hours, not worrying about it anymore. Then later in the evening, he goes back outside to see why his parents have been outside for so fucking long. It's then that he sees that one of the turbines has been painted red and his parents' corpses have been hung from two of the arms of the turbine. The figure in the distance, uh, that being the clown, waved once again and there was now writing on the fence of their house that read, thank you for helping me paint. Um, the end. Now, um, if you were a little bit, uh, confused as to Oh, what the fuck just happened? What, 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 what the hell was that story even about? Well, well, don't worry, I've got the answer for you. You see, uh, the story is actually about... Well, anyway, it's, uh, it's pretty confusing what the fuck is going on throughout this whole story, to say the least. Like, who is the clown? Uh, what did his parents know? Or didn't know? In fact, it was all just so disjointed, I kind of thought the twist was going to be that the kid was already dead or something, and this was some sort of strange purgatory, something like that? But nonetheless, this one's just kind of nonsensical and silly. But there is actually a prequel 
Yes, indeed, this tale is not quite done. So when I found that out, I wondered if some of the questions and nonsense of the original story was uh, maybe cleared up in this one. And of course, like all creepypastas, the prequel is far longer than the original story. So, what is it about? Well, this time it's about a 17-year-old and his family who go to the circus, and him and his brother eventually have to go to uh, the child-only show, where he has to keep an eye on his little brother. This is all much to the annoyance of our protagonist, who couldn't care less about the elephants, people doing tricks, tiger stuff, and all the other general circus performance art. This all eventually comes to a head, however, when his parents, who were off doing something else, are introduced onto the stage. And their mother warns the both of them to run from this place, which pisses off the ringmaster, and just as the two boys are uh, getting very scared and they try to escape, they, well, uh, don't. Now from here, the story connects with the original, as we meet the head of this circus, the same clown from before in the uh, field, who seems to enjoy torturing and killing people, because of course he does. And he wants our young protagonist to paint with the blood of his victims, which he does for some time, thinking that it's in exchange for his younger brother's life. And then, well, uh, I'll be honest, after that, the whole third act of the story just completely goes off the deep end again with being nonsensical and just plain bad. See, it involves the clown getting ready to kill our protagonist's younger brother and make him use his blood to paint as well, which I don't know why he'd do that at that point. He doesn't really have any motivation to keep, to, but whatever. But then the clown's right-hand woman named Melanie betrays him for some reason Reason, and then she helps them escape and in their escape they find this big field of turbines where there are a bunch of locked up children in there and so then they all help them escape and then you know when the clown catches up to them Melanie cuts her own arm and that for some reason makes the clown like get passive for some reason because he like thinks that her blood is just so beautiful that he cannot put his dirty hands on her uh, which she uses to her advantage um you know by rubbing her blood all over our protagonist and then she stabs the clown and it seems like he's dead uh, but not really because then there's a police report as like an epilogue of the story after all of this detailing everything that happened and that the clown is still at large and that our protagonist uh, for some reason is acting like a serial killer now even though that he wasn't doing that at all before then and it just seemed like he just wanted to get his brother out safe but now he's like gonna become serial killer clown too or something um the end so uh, uh did that answer any of your questions regarding the first one hmm? yeah uh maybe it did uh, for me it uh it, it did not you know it's stories like these that really make me say wow you know at least jeff the killer was like coherent you know like at least i could like understand what was going on even if it was really stupid at least it had a sort of logical chain of events to some degree but these two i genuinely don't know what the author was going for here at any rate that's enough clown stuff next rap rant so this one's got a special place in my heart. It starts off with our narrator asking us if we've ever heard of a game called Nightmare. Quote, have you ever heard of Nightmare? Like a lot of other games from the 90s, it came with a VHS which you timed with your play. The character on the video would give you instructions on what to do while you played the game in real time. Being a scaredy cat, I refused to play it when my mom bought it for us. My brother was disappointed about not being able to play Nightmare, but my mom had a solution. She brought out Rap Rat. It was a cheap, dingy little thing catered to kids my age. You went around the board and collected cheese, and the first player to reach the end would win. It seemed simple enough, and since it reminded us of Mousetrap, which we didn't have, there were no objections. We popped the movie into the VHS and set up the board. The first part of the video was just a simple explanation of the rules as well as instructions on how the game worked. Then, Rap Rat came onto the TV. He was not what any of us were expecting. My smaller brother, who was only three at the time, immediately left the room crying. The rat did not even resemble a rat. The ears were far too big. It had a mouth lined with two teeth, and the inside of the mouth looked almost 
swollen. The most striking part about the thing, though, was the eyes. They were large, glassy, and fish-like. I asked then, bothered, then begged my mom to turn it off. Rap Rat suddenly shouted loudly, screaming and wailing, saying, WAIT YOUR TURN! in a demonic, low-pitched voice that was not at all like his normal obnoxious nasal voice. In the background, you could hear the narrator saying, He's Rap Rat, and he's the boss. Over, and over, and over again, in an overly serious tone, unquote. From there, something crazy happens. Quote, the video was indescribable. Images crossed the screen in quick succession, overcut with Rap Rat's expressionless eyes. The images were some of the things I was afraid of at the time. A person looking over a balcony, a hornet slowly stinging someone's eye, an extreme close-up of a tarantula, a pit full of writhing cobras, and a bloodied syringe filled with green fluid. We immediately turned the video off and I ran out of the room screaming, slamming my door. It took my mom 20 minutes to convince me that the video was gone, that I would never, ever see it again. I had nightmares all week about Rap Rat, unquote. There's then a time skip, and our narrator is now an adult. He's planning on moving in with his girlfriend, so he starts going through his old stuff, including his closet, and finds an another than an old Rap Rat game. This kind of freaks him out, and he explains to his girlfriend the story from his childhood, but she doesn't believe him. So, he sets out to prove it to her by getting a VHS player and showing her the tape. Quote, I borrowed my neighbor's VHS and played the video for her. However, the images had changed. I saw a clown, its nose bursting and spraying blood onto the screen. I saw a woman alone in the dark room. I saw a man being forced to pick up white hot metal and hold it in his outstretched hand, turning his hand into a leathery mess. The scratching I heard as a child continued, picking up louder and louder. Then Rap Rat showed up and began twisting and convulsing, his arms thrusting this way and that. The costume wasn't a costume anymore, the felt was real fur. His face wasn't plastic, but instead a bristle of thorns with teeth. The eyes turned inward and suddenly popped out again. Rap Rat's huge fish eyes were inside out staring right at me, watching my every move, my every expression. It grinned wildly and gestured at my girlfriend and I with a single outstretched inhuman hand. I could hear the faintest scratching at my front door. The TV went blank, showed static. The scratching got louder. It wasn't scratching anymore, but thumping. The thumping of tiny feet on wood. My girlfriend embraced me in fear and my senses kicked in. Before anything else could happen, I stopped the video, ejected it, and unplugged the VHS. The scratching stopped. When I looked out the living room window, nothing was there." Unquote. Well, after all that, they tried to call the police, but they, of course, found nothing. Both he and his girlfriend began having nightmares every night. At some point, he wants to get to the bottom of this and, in his words, sue the company for damages, which, okay, fair enough, I guess. He finds out the name of the company that made both Rap Rat and Nightmare. Uh, they were once called a couple of cowboys. They, however, went defunct in 1994, only two years after they created Rap Rat. We then get the epic backstory for how Rap Rat came to be. Quote, in 1992, the year of the game's development, a couple of cowboys had commissioned a manufacturing company in Haiti to create the doll portrayed in the game. The company who created the puppet ran a sweatshop, where they forced women and children to produce the various components of the puppet, including the felt and plastic of the doll. One day, a young Haitian girl got her arm caught in the industrial sewing machine, the spring loader. Unable to handle the weight of the machine, came loose and struck the child's neck, killing her instantly. A few days after the funeral, the mother of the child came to the factory, demanding to see the owner, who denied that he had anything to do with it. In a fit of rage, the mother said that the blood of the innocent would seep into every crevice of the doll, every component with which it is created, and all who touched it would die. She claimed to have summoned a fear demon and screamed at the top of her lungs. Apparat, 
will curse you. The owner simply laughed and told his corporate bosses about Apparat. They spread the joke from person to person, and the game was eventually renamed to Rap Rat, a loose anagram of Apparat. Each recitation of the name Apparat brought with it a greater and greater curse. Only two years after Rap Rat was created, the company was shut down and the owners hired by Mattel. There were stories of the workers begging for days off, skipping work for weeks and weeks, finding the puppets in strange places. Sooner were the stories of self-exit the game, grim, violent self-exits of the game, in which workers would stab their hands and burn themselves to death, writing, I am fear, on the nearest surface in blood. Nobody knows where the Rap Rat doll went after the original creators disappeared. Some say that the last things the victims saw before going insane were large, sunken, fish-like eyes. Unquote. The story ends with a warning about never saying the word apparat out loud, as saying a demon's name out loud is inviting it into your home, which since I'm the one reading the story, I guess I'm already fucked. You're welcome. And he also notes that, quote, a lot of people have been watching the normal video from the normal board game. That's the thing. Rap Rat can be normal. It'll trick you into thinking it's just a puppet and then stalk you day and night." Unquote. And that's Rap Rat, and even though it's pretty silly, I actually kind of find it charming. It's a pretty simple, haunted game sort of story, but there's something kind of funny about it that I can't quite put my finger on. Maybe it's just the idea of this cartoon rat haunting the children's dreams, and maybe I'm just going crazy at this point, you know, <laughs> after reading this many creepypastas. I suppose it's just a fun, scary story that while not super scary to me, I think is a fairly well put together little urban legend type tale. Not bad, and one I certainly remember fondly from the past. The Thing in the Window I'm pretty freaked out. That thing has been there for almost a week. The figure in the window. It looks featureless. Only skin on a human frame, and it's pressing itself against the glass somehow. I don't know how it got there, and I don't know how to get rid of it. At first I thought it was a prank, a doll or a mannequin that some jerks put there to scare me. But I realized as I walked out of my house to pull it away, it wasn't there. I shrugged it off thinking that someone had hidden it while I was walking through my door. but. I went back in and looked out the same window, and it was looking in, staring at me. I walked around my house yelling for whoever it was to come out, but no one was there. The thing is hairless and naked, and it didn't look like it actually had eyes, or even a face at all, but its head is turned toward me when I enter the room. When I sit on my computer, I can feel its faceless hatred boring into my neck, but when I turn around, it innocently turned in a different direction. Finally on Thursday, I tried to open the window, but it stuck. I think the thing's hands are keeping it down, but I got a good look at its face. Its eyes and mouth are behind the skin, pushing outward. It stared at me, smiling. I pulled back a fist and smashed it into the glass, determined once and for all to get rid of the glaring monster. I know I'm strong enough. That glass should have cracked, but it didn't. It shuddered under my hand, but it didn't break. And that smile just got wider and wider and wider until I thought its head would break in half. It raised its own hand and bashed the window of his palm. It was mocking me. But I saw the faintest crack begin to appear where it had hit, and I backed away. No way did I want that smile in the same room as me. So I got a roll of duct tape and I started covering the window. I couldn't look directly at it. I nearly shit my pants just knowing it was watching me, but I couldn't help it. I took a quick glance at the skin-covered face. A small peek, 
It was angry. That menacing grin was now gaping frown full of teeth. The skin had ripped away from its mouth and I could see down its carnivorous throat. A menacing rumble started to fill the house and that hairline crack began to spread like splintering ice. I pulled down the duct tape. The rumble stopped. The split skin sealed over. And I began to smile again. Now it's night, and the noise hasn't started again. There are no sounds, no rumble, no crackling glass. Everything's quiet now, but I can feel its claws gripping the back of my chair. I can hear its skin stretching as it smiles. It's watching me type. Autopilot. So this one's kind of based all around its twist ending, but it starts with the following. Quote, Have you ever forgotten your phone? When did you realize you'd forgotten it? I'm guessing you didn't just smack your forehead and exclaim, Damn, a prose of nothing. The realization probably didn't dawn on you spontaneously. And more likely, you reach for your phone, pawing open your pocket or handbag, you were momentarily confused by it not being there. Then you did a mental recap of the morning's events. Shit. In my case, my phone's alarm woke me up as normal, but I realized the battery was lower than I expected. It was a new phone and it had this annoying habit of leaving applications running that drained the battery overnight. So I put it on to charge while I showered and stuff into my bag like normal. It was a momentary slip from the routine. But, that was all it took. Once in the shower, my brain got back into the routine. It follows every morning, and that was it. Forgotten. Unquote. The narrator then goes on to talk about how this is a normal and at times dangerous brain function that we all have. Uh, to go into autopilot. To assume everything is in order. Our brain filing it away. Even if we had forgotten something. No matter how big or small the detail. The autopilot can kick in and then it's forgotten until it's too late for you to fix the issue immediately. Like leaving your phone at home and only remembering once you're already at work. He goes on to talk about how his day went without his phone at work and all that sort of stuff. And really contemplating the idea of our brains going to autopilots. Now, that said, it is kind of hard to do what comes next, this twist justice here, because there's a fair bit of build up after this. But basically the dude gets in his car with his daughter, uh, drives her up to her nursery, and then heads to his work. It's a hot summer day, the day baking those inside of the office building as he ponders upon the idea of autopiloting even more, and the strange quirks of the brain. He then drives back home, heads inside to finally grab his phone, when his wife asks where Emily is. And it's at this point that he remembered something. He never actually dropped her off at the nursery. He only drove up to it and left. She had been in the car for nine hours in the sizzling sun. He left his phone on the counter that day, the same day that he left his daughter for dead in his back seat. And that's the story. Pretty simple, but very dark all the same, with some a pretty good build up to a terribly, terribly tragic twist. Elevator Safety Guide. This one reads like an actual safety guide for other such things, with plenty of rules such as only 10 people in at a time, uh, don't bring dogs into the elevator, be respectful of others' personal space, etc. And then it starts going on about not touching the handprints on the walls. Don't look at the reflection of the passengers that aren't actually there. Don't get off on floors that don't exist. You know, scary stuff like that. And that's pretty much it. And not much to this one. Instant death disease. So this one is, uh, it's, um, well, I think it's about that time that we do another full reading to do it justice. Quotes. I was a worker working at Colcanom Laboratories, Wales. We work with drugs and medical elements, creating cures and vaccines. My boss told me that whatever I do, I should never tell anyone about what we are doing. He began acting strangely only a few weeks ago, when we began Project 
axolotl. We were aiming to give humans the ability to regenerate lost limbs, but it went wrong. Horribly wrong. My boss called me up to see him. He was a tall man with dark hair. He told me that he, there seemed to be a problem with testing Area 5B, where my best friend was working. Of course, I immediately took the job of going down there and checking with him if all was good. It was not. My friend was sweating terribly and breathing heavily. His hands were shaking and he backed away from the testing area. I had never been in the testing area. Well, not while I was a professor at work, anyway. I worked upstairs, where we formed chemical combinations and researched, dissected, and examined. I thought that in the testing area we'd be testing on animals. No matter how cruel that sounds, it sounded a whole lot better than what we were actually doing. Testing on humans. He backed away from the glass panel and I stared through, asking what was wrong. His hands trembled and he tried to pull me away, telling me not to look. The humans were there, all dead. I was immediately sickened. The idea of testing on each other sounded horrible to me, but I noticed that Wong was alive. She held her child in her arms. We were also testing on small children. Suddenly, she looked at the corpses. She looked at us and mouthed something. I looked away and didn't see. The sight of death itself proved too much for me, but I heard a sickly groan from my friend. Dread filled me. I grabbed him by the shirt and shook him. He gave a hollow rattle, as if there were no eternal organs in him. I felt the sudden need to get as far away as I could. I cut my hands over my ears and closed my eyes, running, although bumping into walls, all the way back into my boss's office. I told him frantically what happened, waving my arms madly. My boss's eyes opened wide, but then he smiled. He grinned, began laughing. That laugh was not of mirth, it was of insanity. It drove me mad, his demonic chuckle screaming through the room. He explained, we had been forming a disease, a new special disease. It would instantly kill our opponents. He had injected one dose into the test subjects of 5B, then told one of the men to read off of a card. Once he read it, he gave out a sickening gasp. He was dead. When his body was examined by scientists just a few rooms away from me, the thought of this caused me to vomit, they found that he had lost all of his eternal organs, all at the same time. His death had been instant, but excruciatingly painful for that fraction of a second. The thing is, the woman next to him heard what he said and suffered the same fate, only mouthing the words to the man next to her. He then shouted the words, only heard by the baby. The last woman was deaf and mute. The woman was terrified at losing her baby. She went insane, but did not show symptoms of the disease. She cradled the baby and wrote to the scientists, Why won't my baby drink? Why is he so pale? How come he's so cold? This was too much to bear. The card was shown again, and after reading it and mouthing the words to my best friend, died. Anyone who says the name of the disease, reads it, hears it, sees it lip red, feels it in braille, sees it on Morse code or click code or any language, is instantly killed. Instant. Although unbelievably painful, he said. He asked me if I wanted to know the name of the disease. I screamed no, covered my ears and ran outside the door. <laughs> when I peered back, my boss was laughing. He hadn't even said it. I went home, trying not to think about it. When I went to bed, I dismissed it as A, a crazy dream, or B, my boss pulling a prank. However, I felt like I was lying to myself. I couldn't help but feel that way, you know? I couldn't get to sleep. I felt a churning in the pit of my stomach. My head throbbed like it was imploding, and I felt as if someone had taken a sledgehammer to my shins. Deciding to call in sick, I rung up my boss in the morning. I explained to him, and he just laughed. His sickening chuckle dissolved into a disconcerting giggle. He told me, okay, uh, but I'd be missing out. It was in all the newspapers. Colchinome Laboratory shut down. All employees found dead. Company president, Mr. B.H. Large, found dead in office. No evidence of how deaths occurred. No weapon found. No gas leaks. Sign of accident. Only worker survived. C.W. Dickinson stayed home sick. 
I couldn't take it. I packed everything I could grab into a suitcase, smashed open my rainy day jar, the contents of which amounted to about 50 pounds, and stuffed the notes and coins into my wallet, which now felt like a lead weight. I started up my car, cranked up the radio, and regardless of what was on, I floored it. I drove as far as I could until I had almost crossed the border. My radio buzzed. This just in from the Kolkanom Laboratories case. The dead seem to have no eternal organs. There is no sign of lacerations or wounds. It is almost as if their eternal organs simply vanished. This seems instant. By recordings, CCTV, and a three-letter message scrawled by one of the employees may prove that it certainly wasn't painless. I crammed the CD in and slammed on the pedal, doing a halfish U-turn and L-turn, and went for the countryside. I drove and drove, aimlessly following roads roughly north. I didn't stop until I ran out of gas where I grabbed my cases and ran. When I entered a field and I couldn't carry my cases anymore, I threw them in a ditch. As long as I could run, I ran. I didn't sleep until my body dropped. I woke tired and groggy, my bones aching. I knew I had run from what I knew. There was a virus going around. I knew exactly what my boss had done. He had shouted the name of the disease over the loudspeakers. Everyone who heard died. Some tried to block their ears, but the words flashed on the computers. The lights blinked it in Morse code. Everyone in that building was now dead. The terror they must have felt. The split second of reality bending agony. All the friends, the men and women I used to know. I'm now sleeping in a hotel room I found. It's far away. It's old and quaint. I think I'll be fine here. They don't have TV and I always stay away from the radio. I'll live. I know a harrowing truth, but I can't tell. I have the name of the disease. It's simple. It's blunt. It does exactly what it says on the can. I call it instant death. Disease. <laughs> uh, the end. And that's the tale. Um, it's, you know, pretty bad. But if you can believe me, on the same tier, I have a story that makes this one seem like fine literature. This is one of the most infamously bad creepypastas ever written. One by the name of Blood Whistle. So, I don't even know where to begin with this one. It's somehow all of these things at once. A cliche video game based creepypasta, an edgy gore fest, grammar wise perfectly competent, purple prosed, boring, dead fucking serious shitty pasta. The story starts off with the following paragraph and this um, sort of disclaimer. Quote, this is the recorded blog of a college student who was playing a modified version of Super Mario Bros. 3 on his computer. Shortly after submitting the last story, he committed self-exit the game of life in his dorm room. Unquote. Then the story proper begins. Quote, a friend of mine recently sent me what he claims to be a weird Super Mario Bros. 3 hack that he wanted me to try out, because he didn't have the courage to. I started this blog to record my progress through the game. He got this from a weird and presumably fucked up place, and I've seen some pretty scary occurrences with emulator games before. Just look at Ben. All of that aside, however, there was something definitely off about this ROM. His title was SMB3BW. Anyhow, I won't play any today as I'm quite busy with college work and such, but I will definitely start tomorrow." Unquote. So, um, obviously the ending of the story was given away from the start, which is almost never a good idea, and it also commits the terrible sin of mentioning another, more popular creepypasta, thus implying that the guy who's writing this story either reads them a whole lot while he's writing this one, which is both meta and extremely not scary, or Ben Drowned is somehow real in this story's universe, which is on a whole nother scale of dumb. That said, what follows is a long, detailed description of the game as he plays through it. It all starts out normal until he discovers the secret to unlocking the game's true nature. 
quote, I wish I hadn't unlocked that secret. This game will be the bane of my existence. I'll try my best as I can to explain what happened and what will certainly entail. I don't know if any of you will believe me, but this sick mockery of one of my childhood favorites must be exploited and never be seen by the eyes of any other breathing man on God's green earth. And Todd, what I'll call my friend for the sake of privacy and possibly security, do not send that link to anyone else. You'll see why below. I entered the castle stage, knowing its only secret was the warp whistle. I disposed of the dry bones before donning a raccoon tail. With a running start, I was flying above the stage until I hit the secret area. My whole life before I hit up on my arrow keypad was completely different. I was happy. I was normal. I could wake up in the morning recognizing my own reflection, being absolute about my safety. Now it's lies. All lies. I know that, as of what happened today, my life will become an infernal hell in which every day will be a futile struggle to retain my own sanity. After finishing this wretched collage of electronic dejection, I will embrace death like a long lost lover with open arms. Now, to get on with what had come to pass. The blocks that lined the wall were a gloomy, albeit polished obsidian black. Mario's skin now had a grayish tint to it, but that wasn't what was wrong with that picture. The music was a sped up version of the normal bonus room theme. Toad's skull was cracked open and profusely bleeding, spilling blood onto the floor and making the room slippery like an ice stage. His mouth was also agape and spewing blood onto the floor. The blood had an eerie reflective quality that should have been graphically impossible for an 8-bit game like Mario 3. I walked up to him to see what it is that he might have to say. What he had to offer is this, blood whistle. Hear its cry. I then ran towards the chest to see its contents. The chest was drenched in reflective, realistic blood of the same type, emanated by the orifices and exposed cranium of the poor little mushroom-headed fellow. Pressing onward, I ran through it to discover its dark secret, its twisted surprise. I wasn't prepared for the following events. A blood-soaked warp whistle ominously arose from what I now believe to be the deepest crevice of hell. It blipped twice as the normal whistle would. That, my fellow reader, was the only normality of what I have played today. It played a deep tune that I can't get out of my head as I write this. The whistle descended, violently striking Mario in the chest. He unleashed a blood-curling scream as it went into his back and out of his chest. His cry wasn't 8-bit at all. It wasn't even close to cartoon-esque. It sounded like an unfiltered anguish of utter agony. His expression reflected the same. To end my experience on this perverse version of something I once loved, Mario was transported to the warp zone of the blood whistle. I call it this because it had only the cookie cutter outline of a quaint island. The water consisted solely of the same blood aforementioned in my encounter with the whistle. Corpses of Koopas and other enemies of Mario were scattered afloat near the shores. White menacing eyes glared at me between the waves. Surf just to cast their evil glance at Mario, or me. I can't be sure at this point. All the worlds were indicated by their respective numbers, and all the dots were crimson. At this point, I noticed yet another abnormality, this time concerning the dot of the world eight. Beside it were two eight bit patches of fire that twisted and contorted in place. Without me pressing any buttons, the whistle stabbed Mario in the ribs. This cued him to move to the World 2 dot, refusing to pay any further attention to the horrors that surely await in the distorted desert. I saved the game and quit. I have played more than enough of my fill for today. I guess I figured out the acronym of the ROM title meant Blood Whistle the Hard Way. Despite the horrors that plague this abomination, I will continue to subject myself to this suffering for the sake of all of you. Well, also for mine. It'll help me keep track of the days, and maybe this desperate attempt to cling to my stable frame of mind won't prove to be in total vain. There are 5,000 people that have followed this blog in the two days that it's been up. 
after this pointedly interesting post, I'm hoping to have some more. For those of you following my posts, read tomorrow's and share with your friends. I need you to expose the stark luridness of this shell of something I once knew and loved." Unquote. Very dramatic, to say the least. In fact, I think this might be the most dramatic video game based creepypasta protagonist, narrator I guess, whatever, this ever existed. It's so over the top that it's almost kind of funny accidentally. Like imagine if this is all it takes for this guy to go into this deep detail of these the horrors, the hell that he's going through. Imagine if you played something like Silent Hill or Resident Evil or Clock Tower or something. And while I appreciate the more complex vocabulary that's clearly shown throughout this creepypasta, when it's about something as mundane as a creepy Mario ROM hack, it all starts to just feel a little bit uh, pretentious, or at the very least much. You know what I mean? What's more is the whole story goes on this way as well, and it just gets worse and worse with quotes like these. While I die, fibers of my perception of reality long enough to play through World 2, I have come to the conclusion that whoever made this is completely and utterly deranged. There's been a rusted gear or broken spring in the mechanics of their sadistic mind. Their only purpose in creating this mod was to mentally and psychologically flagellate the naive soul poor enough to take the bait of its mysterious origin. Well, I'm fucking dumb enough to fall into that category. I digress to the experience. Or, quote, Oh, that reminds me of another thing. You're probably wondering why I am complacently talking about Mario as if he is a human being. A human who suffers pain, sorrow, depression, starvation, and thirst like the rest of us. A human who is capable of feeling happiness, remorse, goodwill, and love like anyone else. Else is because I thoroughly am convinced that he is. Please don't stop following this blog because you think I'm insane. That will come later. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that inside this game is a character with a complex range of emotions. Someone who feels like you and me. But it's just a game, right? It's just a contrived mixture of code and data put together to present words and images, correct? Wrong. I know with everything inside of me that Mario has to be alive. I have seen him truly happy and truly sad. And at one point, I may even see him truly angry. He feels like any other living, breathing human being." Unquote. It's, uh, uh, it's all rather crazy. I do like that he acknowledges at first that it's some weirdo who made the game. That said, it's also just a horror-themed Mario game, so I don't really know if making that alone suddenly makes you evil. Uh, that said, Mario goes through some terrible torture here, from being cut up to uh, having his like heart ripped out and all that sort of stuff, eaten alive by giant fish, all sorts of terrible, terrible stuff, only to come back again and again to endure yet more pain. The game also starts to know more information about our protagonist's past. At one point, someone tried to report the author as insane and had his campus police pay him a visit, and he continues to describe the bloody mess that uh, was the level's several worlds in mind-numbing detail. At one point, the protagonist compares his journey through this game as fighting one hell of a war, like D-Day, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, he then states the following, quote, I'm starting not to care anymore. I am in the throes of such a severe depression, it's all starting to fade away. Everything. School. Friends. Family. It's safe to say this game is single-handedly ruining my life. Such sadness has never become me ever before in my life. My grandfather died when I was young, but that didn't come close to equate to what I'm feeling now. It's a direct result of the level that I played today, which I'll get into right now." Unquote. Ooh, oh yes, ah, uh, sit there and mm, savor that for a moment. I don't know if we're going to get a video game creepypasta with as ridiculous of a paragraph as that one on this iceberg. So soak it in. Take a deep, long breath. Because this was peak. What the fuck did I just read? 
<laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, fam. You know I wouldn't hold out on you. That shit is nothing compared to this next quote. It is ironic, indeed, that today is June the 13th. The unlucky number. The unlucky day. I suppose today isn't completely horrible. Today is the last day I had to play this wretched game. This horrifyingly absurd remake of what I used to see as a wonderful game will soon be out of my life, along with everything else. With this being my last post, I, I suppose I can be finally honest about my true intentions ever since I finished World 2. I'm going to commit self-exit the game of life. This game has caused me sorrow on such an inevitable level that there is no other option. Life will never be the same. Mom and Dad, I love you. Michael and Kelsey, you guys be good. Listen to Mom and Dad. They have a lot of valuable lessons to teach you. Lessons that I learned but can never apply again. Now, for what you 75,000 followers read this post for, the rest of the game. <laughs> so I guess that's why our author decided to commit exit the game, of life that is. He can't exit this game that's making him want to die, you see, because uh, uh, he can't turn off the game that makes him want to end himself because uh, anyway, this game is just so bad that he has to die. Sorry everybody, the cord to my brain is already disconnected. I might as well disconnect my heart while I'm at it, you know? At any rate, more spooky shit happens in the game. Princess Peach is actually evil, I guess. Big twist. And then he beats the game and dies because the game was uh just that scary, you know? What what can you do? What can you do? And that was Blood Whistle. I skipped around a lot, I know, but honestly the details of the game are just kind of boring and honestly hard to focus on when you have the world's most idiotic protagonist right smack there in front of you. That said, it is so over the top that it was kind of fun seeing just exactly how this guy was going to react every single time. And I kind of like to imagine like what if he was watching something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or some shit. He was like, these are real human beings of a soul. I can't bear to live knowing that this exists. What a fucking weenie. It's a bad creepypasta. What more is there really to say? Cat flap. This one's kind of weird um, because it's really short, but all it really amounts to is this guy or gal is afraid of cat flaps, you know, the little doors on doors for cats, uh, because he mistakes the cat's behind as a, a monster coming in. He sees the tail as like a nose and the asshole as an eye. You know, it's, that's, that, that's pretty much it. That's the joke. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Persuaded. This one, like so many this tier, is another short one, and it's a basic story about a zombie apocalypse starting, but with a slight twist. The zombies are not only fast, but they are also aware, as in they are actually intelligent creatures. This leads to our narrator eventually seeing his neighborhood get overrun by them, jumping through windows, breaking through everything, so he grabs his supplies and hides in the most secure place in his house, the bathroom. However, one of them saw him before he went in, and so now the rest of the story is the zombies outside of his door, trying to persuade him to open up, that he can't be in there forever. The story ends with him having been in there for two days and wondering if maybe being a zombie would be so bad. Overall, uh, a decent enough little story, but one that I think could have had a little bit more meat on its bones, as I like the idea of zombies that can talk, but not much is actually done with it besides the initial concept. Tomino's Hell. So this one is best read in full since it's both short and adds to the atmosphere. Quote, this is a popular Japanese story. It is a, about a poem called Tomino's Hell. They say that you should only read it with your mind and never aloud. If you were to read it out loud, then you must take responsibility for your actions. Tomino's Hell is written by Yamoda Inohiko in a book called The Heart is Like a Rolling Stone, 27th collection of poems in 1919. It's not sure how this rumor started, but there's only a warning that if you read this poem out loud, tragic things will happen. This story used to be very popular on 2chan, and there were many people taking pictures and videos as proof and posting them on 2chan. 
There were many users that said that nothing happened, but there were also many posts that didn't have the user come back to post the results. I think it's scarier than someone posting that someone else got sick or that someone else had passed away. But if you were to read it out loud, it's better to read it in Japanese rather than in the translation. So with that in mind, I hope you're all ready to hear the English translation of the poem read aloud. <laughs> Let's read. Quote, Tomino's hell. His older sister vomited blood. His younger sister vomited fire. And the cute Tomino vomited glass beads. Tomino fell into hell alone. Hell is wrapped in darkness and even the flowers don't bloom. In the person with the whip, Tomino's older sister, I wonder whose blood is on it. Hit, hit without hitting. Infinite. Hell's one road. Would you lead him to the dark hell? To the sheep of gold? To the bush warbler? Fit as much as you can into the leather sack for the preparation of a journey in the familiar hell. Spring is coming even in the forest and the stream. Even in the seven valley streams of the dark hell. The bush warbler in the bird cage, the sheep in the wagon, tears in the eyes of cute Tamino. Cry, bush warbler, toward the raining forest. He shouts that he misses his little sister. The crying echo reverberates throughout hell. The fox Benoit blooms circling around hell's seven mountains and seven streams the lonely journey of cute tamino if they're in hell bring them to me the needle of the graves i won't pierce with the red needle in the milestones of little tamino Unquote. now of course a poem isn't going to kill you and well, I'm still here, so I guess it didn't kill me either. It's only a Japanese urban legend after all, but one that's been pervasive for some time. The poem itself was actually written by poet Saijo Yaso all the way back in 1919. There were many interpretations of what the poem might be about, but all the same, it does have an aura of general despair to it that some say comes from the loss his author felt when he lost his father and sister to World War One, while others believe it comes from the story between the lines of this poem, that being about a girl who murdered her parents and now descends into the lowest part of hell. There are other interpretations of that story in between the lines though, like some people interpret it as the girl being locked in the cellar and beaten by her parents. Or maybe it's just the general hell of losing a loved one, or even life itself. It's hard to say. Oh, and also this famous picture that is always associated with this poem was never actually made for it, though it does add a very disturbing visual to connect with the poem. The piece was actually made by an artist by the name of Yuko Tatsushima, and is titled, I Don't Want to Bride Anymore. And from what I understand, it is made to represent some sort of self-harm and other dark related topics. I check out her other stuff as well. It's all pretty interesting, if a bit tragic and sad in the same respect. Channel Infinity. So this is one of those ritual pastas, similar to Bloody Mary and the like, where you have to perform some sort of task in a ritualistic form, usually for some sort of reward, uh, but not always, and always at great risk to yourself though. This ritual starts with the following, quote, there is a legend circulating around the television industry. It is about Channel Infinity. Channel Infinity is hard to get to, and reports vary as to what it actually is. I will tell you how to get there, and then what to do, unquote. From there, some instructions are given on how to access Channel Infinity, and it starts with the following steps, quote, Acquire a television, preferably with analog for the best experience. The older, the better. 
Acquire a remote control. It does not have to go with the television that you're using. Turn on the TV and set it to a channel that is static or just a plain black screen if you're using a digital TV. Basically any channel you do not receive. Leave the room for about three hours. If you have a significant other in the house, have them with you. It is also best to call over a few friends. During those three hours, you should acquire a few items. I will list them in order from most important to least. Note that none of these are mandatory, but they help. You will want an item that you hold dear, two handheld mirrors, a firearm or other weapon, a favorite book, a mobile communications device, a key, a sledgehammer or pickaxe. After roughly three hours have passed, re-enter the room. Have everyone else wait outside the door. Close the door. Stare at the static or blank screen or whatever you set your TV to until you feel disoriented or freaked out. Call the others into the room. Give the item that you hold dear to the person that you care about the most in the room. Then send them back out. If you did not grab an item that you hold dear, hug that person and whisper a secret into their ear. Send them back out and command them to not come back in no matter what until you open the door again. Note this will be harder for them if there are more of them, but it will be safer for you if there are more people. Trust me. Hold the mirror so that one is reflecting the television screen into the other, and the second is reflecting you, so it looks as if the television is behind you. Stay like this until a question appears on the screen. If you did not grab the mirrors, then sit in a chair facing away from the TV until you hear a noise. Grab the remote. There will be a question on the screen. Press channel up to answer yes, channel down to answer no. There will be anywhere from three to 26 questions. If reports are to be trusted, the questions will be anywhere from trivial to deep, philosophic, personal questions. Answer truthfully, or you will not succeed in reaching channel infinity." Unquote. So what exactly can be found on channel infinity? Well, it said one of these three things will occur. Number one, your favorite show of all time will come on, but in the episode, all the characters will be heart-wrenchingly killed. Number two, you will see a picture of your least favorite person or thing ever. This is where you use a firearm or other weapon. Break the TV with the weapon. It will then fix itself. Note, this obviously is the easiest of the three things. Or three, a strange, shimmery vortex will surround you, and you will be pulled into an alternate dimension. If option three occurs, there is a whole other set of instructions on what to do when you're in the other dimension. It will be a twisted replica of your house, and there will be beings there that won't want you to leave. All the same though, I'll leave those details aside for now because should you be successful, all three lead to the final result, having access to Channel Infinity. Quote, After this, you will reach Channel Infinity. What you do now is up to you. If you go to the Guide function, you will see shows listed such as The Meaning of Life, How to Acquire True Love, Choose one. Note, the more people you have outside the door with you determines the revelations that are the shows. The more people, the better chance you have of seeing shows with more life-changing results. Or if you keep watching the static without going to the guide or breaking eye contact with the television, you will see a series of images that will, if deciphered, reveal the answer to your greatest question. There are, at this point, many options. Too many to write here. Just do what you feel like you must, and something will happen. The overwhelming majority of things will be good, but some will be bad. You may leave the room at any point. However, there are two catches. You may never speak of what you learned after accessing Channel Infinity, and you may only reach Channel Infinity four times in your life. I hope that you find the experience enlightening." Unquote. And that's Channel Infinity. Like I've said, I'm kind of a sucker for these ritual-based ones, and this one's pretty good, mainly because there is a reward for successfully performing the ritual, which I think adds to it a great deal. Uh, but there is another ritual that I'd like to also give a spotlight as well. One that I remember was all the rage when it first started circulating. Bonus entry, One Man Hide and Seek. For this one, I'll quickly read it in full. Playing hide and seek alone is quite popular in various parts of Asia. Those who have tried it report that it actually works and that they felt their lives were threatened. You will need the following things. 
A doll of legs. The doll serves as a place for the spirit to enter. Therefore, it is advised that you do not use a human doll, or a doll that you really like, because there will be a great chance that the spirit will not leave the doll. Rice. The spirit that eats this offering is said to grow stronger. Red thread. This symbolizes blood and acts of restraint. Something from your body. Fingernails are the most commonly used, but some have also used their own blood, skin, hair, etc. Do not use someone else's body parts, though, or else it will become a curse. A weapon. Something to stab the doll with so that you can anger it. Real knives are dangerous, so most people use pencils or needles. Salt water or alcohol. Without this, the game won't end. This material is used to get rid of the spirit. Hiding place. And finally, a name. Giving the spirit a name is the most powerful thing a human can give it. Names give spirits great power. Step 1. Cut the doll and replace its insides with rice. Step 2. Place something from your body into the doll. Step 3. Wrap the doll with the red thread, as if to hinder it. Step 4. In a bathroom, pour water into a large wash basin and find some place to hide. Step 5. Place a cup of salt water in the place before starting the game. Now here's how to play. Step 1. Start at 3 a.m. because that is the time when spirits are most active. Step 2. Give the doll a name. Step 3. When the clock strikes 3, close your eyes and say, First Tagger is doll's name. Three times. If you're talking to the doll, you must talk sternly. Step 4. Go to the bathroom and place the doll into the wash basin. Step 5. Turn off all the lights. Step 6. Close your eyes and count to 10. Ready your weapon and head to the bathroom. Go to the doll and say, I found you, doll's name, and stab the doll. Afterward, close your eyes again and say, now, doll's name is it, three times. Step 7. Place the weapon next to the doll and go to your hiding place. You must lock the door as well, as well as all other doors and windows. Step 8. Drink the salt water, but do not swallow or spit it out. The salt water will protect you from the spirit. To end the game, take any leftover salt water or alcohol and find the doll. Keep in mind that the doll may not be in the bathroom, and there have been instances of being outside. When you find the doll, spray the salt water in your mouth on the doll and do the same with the excess water you have left. Close your eyes and shout, I win, I win, I win. The spirit in the doll will give up, and then the game ends. It is advised to dispose of the doll by burning it afterward. Here are some important notes. Keep the game under two hours. After two hours, the spirit in the doll will be too strong to be removed. You must play alone. The more people there are, the higher chance of someone getting possessed. Do not go outside. When you're hiding, be silent. Turn off all electronics before starting. When running away, do not look back. Also, don't fall asleep while playing. The doll might stab you. When discovered by the doll, you can get a small wound or even get possessed. If found by the doll, be careful because your weapon will be somewhere on the floor or in your pocket. After the game is over, it is important to clean up properly. Be sure to put salt in every corner of the house, especially places where you put the doll and where you found it. Salt is said to scare spirits away. People who have played have reported some of the following events that usually take place while playing. TV channels changing on their own, perfectly normal lights flickering, doors opening and closing, as well as hearing the sound of laughter." Unquote. And that's how you play One Man Hide and Seek. And while the idea is already creepy enough, imagine actually playing it. Though, I have no idea why the fuck you would ever play it because, I mean, yeah, it just sounds like a bad time. I mean, it's not going to work, obviously, but still, theoretically, it would be kind of a bad time. That reminds me, though, does anyone remember a channel by the name of Lupus Creepus? I used to love watching that guy's videos, primarily his series called Will It Kill Me, where he and his friends would basically try out all these rituals a few times. Of course, the whole problem with the show is that nothing ever happened because, you know, well, 
all this stuff is fake. But like I said, I have a soft spot for this kind of stuff, and be it with friends or watching a group of friends fuck around with these creepypastas, it's kind of got a comfy vibe to it, you know? But at any rate, it is now time for another Adult Swim related creepypasta. Turn the crank. This one starts with the following paragraph. Quote, have you ever wondered why certain shows were off limits to you as a child? Probably because of swearing, sexual content, the occasional use of the word penis, right? Well, that is true, but there's a deeper layer than that. For me, anyway. Unquote. From this point on, our narrator begins reminiscing about how when he was about six years old or so, he would be fascinated with all the adult cartoon blocks on TV, uh, primarily because his mom would always tell him to not watch them, which only made him want to watch it all the more. It was a uh, forbidden fruit of sorts. Something which may scare him, something adults and cool bigger kids watched, and so he tried whenever he could to watch those late night blocks when he was sure his mom wouldn't be able to catch him. His dad on the other hand didn't really care what his son watched, and at times he would just allow him to watch stuff like South Park alongside him. Which, while they did freak him out from time to time, he enjoyed the experience of immensely. This all leads into the night when our narrator saw something. He was there with his dad, who was already fast asleep, while Adult Swim's normal block played on. Our narrator then describes the TV cutting from the show and transitioning to a black screen. He awaited the normal Adult Swim logo to appear on the screen, but for a while, there was nothing but still blackness. Then an unfamiliar logo appeared on the screen, before fading into black and the THX sound effect began to rise and eventually blare through the TV, something which he surprised didn't wake up his dad at the time. Quotes, We now present our feature presentation, a man boomed, sounding a lot like the person that narrates over movies in the theater. You know, the man who tells you to shut off your cell phone and buy loads of popcorn and candy. Instantly, I felt tons better. I figured that this was all just how Adult Swim presented their movies. And after a day of watching nothing but Disney, I was excited to see the show and movies all my first grade friends got to watch. The only thing I could think of about was bragging to my friends that I had seen an adult movie on the Forbidden Channel." Unquote. What proceeds was a strange sort of film, a little blood droplets falling from a darkened sky. The blood rain was washing the purple hair color from a young woman. The woman's eyes were pitch black slits, resembling that of an electrical outlet, with thin, black little stick figure limbs. An eerie piano music droned on in the background as the camera pans to a window and eventually leads inside the glass, and there sat a fat Santa Claus looking character with a long white beard, blue glass-like eyes, and rosy red cheeks. He sat next to an out-of-proportion record player, which seemed to be playing funeral music. Quote, turn the crank. Turn the crank. He suddenly sputtered as the camera zoomed onto his hand, turning the crank. The motions were agonizingly slow, forcing me to really feel the stillness of the moment. Turn the crank. Turn the crank. I was beginning to feel less thrilled and more anxious now. I took a moment to slide closer to the couch where my dad was fast asleep, completely oblivious to the content on the television. While I slid, a long cracking sound was heard. It dragged on for what felt like a lifetime, growing louder and louder as it continued. I turned back to the screen when the sound caught my attention. The crank that the unnamed character was turning was being wound tighter and tighter, straining the gorgeous wooden base. The base began to reveal tiny cracks as the crank turned. The cracks grew larger, the sound grew louder, and the crank grew weaker. Turn the crank. Turn the crank, the cherry man shouted with a creepy, joyful voice. I could only assume he had a smile on his face, but the only thing the camera would show was the record player slowly collapsing upon itself. Turn the crank! Turn the crank! My eyes were beginning to fill with tears. I remember how loud noises would always upset me when I was younger. I was an odd child, 
Neither silence nor noise pleased me. If it was too silent, I would be scared. If it was too noisy, I'd be equally scared. Unfortunately for me, this movie had already manipulated both of those childhood fears. My teary eyes widened as the next scene of the movie took place. The beautiful record player finally gave out the crank breaking apart into the jolly man's hand. The remaining bits of the record player began to sputter a violent amount of smoke, which surprisingly only hovered around the player, leaving every other inch of the room untouched. No more must I turn the crank. The man whispered, the camera focusing on his face, and his face alone. His cherry-colored cheeks were growing pale, and his glimmering eyes began to lose their luster. Suddenly, those once sparkling blue eyes shattered, shards of glass falling to the floor. I was surprised that they didn't fling into the screen. They just sort of fell from the man's eye sockets. I later figured out that the rain at the start of the film had actually been the glass falling from his face. The Lonesome Girl has finally sank. The screen cut to an abrupt moment of darkness, but only long enough to fade into the next scene. There was another bird eyes view of the street where the female character had been walking at the beginning of the film. There were shards of glass completely coating the street below. All you could see were the very tops of some of the buildings, which were all tinted with a very rusty shade of crimson because of the massive amount of broken glass. The camera began to lower the view, zooming in by showing choppy cut frames, each one closer to the mess than the last. As the last frame was presented, I could see the outlet-like character from the beginning laying motionless in the midst of the glassy sea. The shards that surrounded her body were a pale shade of purple, obviously caused from the color that had completely drained from her hair. By this point, I was bawling my eyes out. I may have been young, but I knew what a dead person looked like. I knew for sure that girl was dead. No one could survive being pelted by so much enormous amounts of glass like that. The scene changed at that point, showing a close-up of an hourglass. The camera was slowly, gently, pulling away from the hourglass, which had grains of sand sliding through its midsection. It kind of reminded me of that soap opera, Days of Our Lives. I'm sure you soap junkies know what I'm talking about. Only it was much more grim and against a colorless background. She's perfectly fine. Now don't you fret. Thanks for watching my show, kids. But you're not out of hell yet." Unquote. Our narrator let out a terrible scream after that last line, which happened to wake his father up. He then proceeded to sleep in his mom's bed that night, and the next morning he overheard his mom scolding his dad over letting him watch adult cartoons at night. Our narrator ends the story noting how he has, of course, seen far worse, a more creepy, disturbing stuff in his life, and in shows and the like since then. But at the time, that short film really affected him, and to this day he's never really been able to find it though there is another part of the story. See, when he initially woke his dad up that night, his dad's elbow hit the TV remote, and it switched to, funnily enough, Adult Swim. The TV hadn't been on Adult Swim at all that night, and what's more is when his dad apologized and changed the channel, the channel that he had been watching up until now, now only showed programming not authorized. Please confirm that you are subscribed to the channel or unplug your receiver to resolve the issue. If you continue to see this error, please contact your cable provider. We apologize for any inconvenience. Our narrators wonder to this day how he was able to watch that film and who made it. Who did the voices and if anyone else has ever seen it. And that's the tale of Turner Crank. And I quite like this one a lot. I already mentioned how I enjoy watching Adult Swim late at night as a kid. And while I obviously never encountered such a thing, it's something I can almost imagine dreaming up in the days of the night as you slowly fall asleep to the sound of Adult Swim. It's also pretty simple and not at all over the top and just mysterious enough and in the same kind of vibe that weird dark Adult Swim experimental stuff was that it almost seems believable. Like this does sound like something that would be on Adult Swim as like a 15 minute short at like 4 o'clock in the morning. And again, I find it much more relatable and even scarier whenever the author acknowledges that yes, there are other things they've seen that are probably scarier than this thing. This thing didn't change their whole life or make them want to take their life or whatever, you know? Uh, but it was something that sticks out in their brain. And those are the types of memories that I think we all have a few of those that we try to think, was that 
real or is that a dream or something in between? Overall, a great and seriously underrated creepypasta. Well guys, it looks like it's that time again. Time for the Jeff the Killer OC bonus round. Yep, that's right. We're gonna be knocking out some of the other Jeff the Killer type stories here. Though I promise these ones were at least a little bit more interesting and different from the uh, typical ones. For the most part, anyway. In fact, two of these are just straight up sequel slash spin-offs of Jeff the Killer. But while the rest of these are just bonus entries that I wanted to get to, uh, this first one is actually on the iceberg and it goes by the title of Liars. So this one, like so many on this tier, is yet again short and simple. The story follows this cool, confident guy named Jimmy, who has a tendency to maybe be a little too honest. He doesn't pull his punches, and he doesn't expect others to do the same with him. Some people love him for this reason, while others, well, don't take too kindly to his mouth. All the same, he ended up saying something about someone's mom being a MILF, but this time he pissed off this psychopath of a kid who decided to gather up his friends to teach Jimmy a lesson. Uh, by throwing formic acid on the guy's face, he screamed in pain and the bullies acted as if he did this to himself on accident, lying to everyone while Jimmy couldn't say a word. Well then, after Jimmy recovered in the hospital, only having sight from one eye now, his face completely ruined, he decides to get revenge on the bullies by kidnapping them torturing them, carving liars into their backs, and of course, finishing them off with formic acid. That's pretty much the whole story. It's not bad, uh, not the best ever, uh, but sort of a concentrated version of one of these types of stories. Honestly, the most memorable part of the story though is this picture that came from it. It seems to be a frame from this particular video from other people's research that I've come across, in case you were wondering. But all the same, it's an unnerving picture that captures that uh, Jeff the Killer vibe, for lack of a better term. I also do like the theming here with him being this guy who tells the truth all the time and the enemies who ruins his life are a bunch of liars. It's simple but effective. Jeff versus Jane the Killer. That's right, somebody actually decided to write the big old payoff to the whole Jane the Killer after a Jeff the Killer thing. Now what's interesting about this one is while it's written by user uh, Logo Mausoleum, it's most well known for being scripted and adapted to audio by Mr. Creepypasta himself, with a whole cast of other Creepypasta related YouTubers at the time voicing different characters. It's by far not only one of his most popular videos, but I think also helped boost Jane the Killer's popularity up by proxy. It's also one of the longer pastas of its kind, and at first it sort of seems like a direct sequel to of the original Jeff the Killer story. With it now being 10 years later, Jeff still very much being the unstoppable emo boy killer, unstoppable force that he once was. However, through a series of events, he finds himself back in his old hometown, the place where it all started. He thinks back to how it was all started by those bullies, that it was their fault for making him into what he is today. And then he enters his old home, surprised when there are parts of the house that still have electricity. It's then that he starts seeing ghostly figures of his mom and dad, his mom a loving and forgiving figure, his father vengeful and angry. He then sees his brother before his very eyes, Louis, who is somehow alive, with a whole story as to how he managed to survive Jeff's original stabbing. He seems to forgive his brother though, it's not clear at this point if this is all in Jeff's mind or what the hell is going on though. Then later, Jeff is at a dive bar, I'm gonna assume hiding his face in some way, when a prostitute comes up to him and offers a night of fun for 50 bucks. Jeff is hungry. I mean, not for that, but for blood. So he agrees. After the two of them go at it, Jeff is then quietly preparing to grab his knife and kill that prostitute, when he suddenly feels queasy and falls asleep. When he wakes back up, he's back in his old house again, but can't tell if it was all just a dream or not, or what the fuck just happened. But that thirst for blood is still very much in need of being quenched. So then we get an extended slasher movie scene, where we have a babysitter slowly getting stalked by Jeff the Killer, as he breaks into the house of the baby she's watching. She hides away, but forgets to grab the baby. She calls 911, and all the while, Jeff is stalking through the dark house. He finds the crying baby, but seems saddened by the sight of it, and decides not to kill him. 
A pair of police eventually get there, but are promptly killed off by Jeff, and then the babysitter is also too brutally killed. Skipping ahead, this is when it all eventually leads into Jeff being knocked out uh, by what he thinks is his brother, but is actually, in fact, Jane the Killer, who I guess in between all this time made a deal with the devil so that she can have the power to shapeshift. She was his brother, his mother, the father of the police investigator, which was a whole other scene that I didn't get into, but it's not that important, as well as the hooker from before, which means Jeff the Killer had sex with Jane the Killer. I guess Jane wanted that Jeff the Killer action after all. Well, anyway, she caught him and begins telling him how much he's longed for this day and that he ruined her life, which makes Jeff laugh as he seems to genuinely not remember who the hell she is. She then begins stabbing him and tearing at the skin on his face before he is able to slip out of his binds and starts beating the shit out of Jane, including putting her hand in a vice so tight that it basically destroys that hand and wrist. The two of them fight for a while before the house they are fighting in catches on fire, and Jeff sees the visage of all his family members from heaven, and they are all happy, and then they all pull out knives and start stabbing Jeff till he seems like he's dead. The story then finally ends with the two of them in a morgue. Jeff is presumed dead, though he then moves his eyes, so no, I guess he's not really dead. While Jane is actually 100% dead, and the cause of her death was apparently, and get ready for this one, childbirth. The end. Now obviously I skipped around a lot to summarize the story, uh, but in short, it's kind of a fun, if nonsensical story, mainly on Jane the Killer's part in particular. Like all the Jeff the Killer related stuff seems mostly like stuff that he would do, uh, but the question must be asked, why did Jane wait so long to knock him out and try to kill him? She pretended to be his parents and brother and taunt him, I get that, but then she proceeds to pretend to be a prostitute. She knows he's gonna try to kill her at this point. She seems to have drugged him. Why didn't she lock him up at that point and kill him? Like, he was right there. Also, why did she have sex with him? Like, she died of pregnancy. Jeff has a kid now. What the fuck? But yeah, she didn't kill him then, and so then he was able to kill three more people right after that. And only then does she capture him. But even then, Jane is still such a stupid bitch because she had him locked up, torture tools at the ready, and somehow she ended up being the one dying in this exchange. Why didn't she just cut his fucking head off? blow him up to smithereens, I don't know, whatever you want to do. She didn't even kill Jeff the Killer and died giving birth to his son, who we all know is gonna be just as evil as him because of how creepy pastas work. She made a deal with the devil to have the ability to shapeshift and utilizes it almost completely uselessly. She did it for no fucking reason. Have fun burning in hell for all eternity, dumbass. That said, I still enjoyed the story in the same way I have a soft spot for all of these uh, Karinge, Jeff the Killer shit. And to be fair, it did kind of feel like a natural conclusion to the tale of Jeff and Jane the Killer, warts and all. It would be jarring for it to be exceptionally good at this point after all. Uh, but I hear you saying, uh, Jeff versus Jane. Nah, man, I want to see Jeff fight someone who isn't a dumbass. I want to see Jeff up against something crazy. Something like, like Jeff the Killer versus Slenderman. Yes, this really does exist. It's a fair bit shorter than Jeff v. Jane as well. Uh, but before we get into it, can we, um, can we just address something real quick? Obviously, it can depend on the version that you're referring to, but in general, I'd say that Jeff fighting Slenderman is one of the most one-sided fight ideas that you could possibly come up with in the creepypasta scene. Slenderman is akin to a Lovecraftian god, unknowable, seemingly unstoppable, versus a young guy with a knife. Maybe you can attribute resilient young guy with a knife, but that's about it. It's like, who would win? Cthulhu or Ghostface? Like, come on, it's just not even fair. 
That said, obviously at this point it's pretty clear that Jeff the Killer's portrayal in these types of stories is a lot closer to a, a slasher villain like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. So I can suspend my disbelief enough to say, okay, so Jeff is like basically immortal then, right? Nothing can stop him, so I guess he might really be a decent fight against Slenderman, maybe? See, then the problem kind of becomes Slenderman, or at least some versions of Slenderman, uh, tend to make people into proxies or something of the sort. Basically, his unstoppable little minions. It kind of seems like if Slenderman came in contact with Jeff the Killer, he'd probably try to make him his new proxy and a really damn powerful one at that. I'm not really sure what the motivation for the Slenderman fighting Jeff would really be. That said, the actual story itself is pretty much just Jeff walks into his hometown, uh, similar to the other story that we just read. He then ends up going into the woods and Slenderman starts stalking him uh, for some reason. The two then eventually throw blows, Jeff being thrown around like a rag doll by Slenderman's tentacles and which gets Jeff the killer to say, and I swear I'm not making this up, Is that all you got? I've suffered worse beatings from my dad's belt! Which is... Like, the most unbadass thing someone who's young writing this thought was a badass thing to say ever. Jeff then gets all cut up, but through the power of insanity is able to hold his ground, and even cuts off one of Slenderman's arms at one point. Which begs the question, if you can just cut off Slenderman's arms, if, you could, if, it's, like, if it's that easy, um, can he be defeated by a gun, you know? Uh, has anyone tried a gun on Slenderman? You know, just once. I know most creepypastas and scary stories would be over far quicker if uh, the person in danger just simply had a gun to handle the situation. But that said, we're talking about Jeff the Killer. You know, how come none of these the killers ever just have a gun once in a while? Surely this would be a useful tool for someone in your trade, yes? Well, at any rate, eventually through a long fight scene, a Jeff is impaled on a tree ranch. Lol, and accidentally lights the fucking woods on fire, which gives Slenderman plenty of time to escape and watch as Jeff screams in terror. His fate surely sealed. Slenderman obviously winning in this fight. Well, except Jeff didn't actually die here either. He's back up a scene later, only a new burn on his face, seemingly being the only real damage seemed to have gotten from that. And he then proceeds to kill a stupid couple that walked into the burned woods. The end. Like I said, pretty short, but I suppose it does deliver about what you're expecting out of it. Slenderman versus Jeff the Killer do have an extended fight scene. One of them does in fact win. I suppose it's kind of similar to uh, Freddy vs. Jason Voorhees, you know? You kind of know what you're coming into the story for, so I suppose all things considered, it's okay. But certainly nothing to write home about. The Bloody Painter. Finally ending this Jeff the Killer related marathon off, we have one that's gotten more and more popular as time has gone on, and one that many consider to be much better than the others of its kind. Written by Delucat, this story is in three pieces, the first of which being written back in 2013 and follows the story of a 14 year old boy named Helen who likes drawing in his notebook. He minds his own business as one of his classmates, Tom, is bullied in the classroom, and he, so too, minds his own business when later on during recess a girl named Judy says that she's missing her watch and some big kid named Ben goes and nabs it out of Helen's bag. He says it wasn't him who stole it and that he doesn't know how it got there but that didn't help at all and the next day as he's walking into the classroom he hears whispers from his classmates about how he's a filthy thief and what have you. This eventually turns on into full-on bullying, as he is now the new target of ridicule. And they tear up his art book, and when he tries to fight back, they beat him up some more, leaving him beaten and bruised. When his teachers and parents ask where he got the marks, he tells them they got it from a bad fall, not wanting to incur an even worse fate for narking. He gets ridiculed, hurt, 
and humiliated for weeks after that. And it all was becoming sort of his new norm. His life was utterly miserable, until he gets a Facebook message from none other than Tom, both relating with one another being the targets of bullying. The two of them become good friends for a while. One night, Tom tells Helen to meet him on top of the school rooftop, that he has something to tell him. It's here that Tom reveals that it was him who stole that watch and put it into Helen's bag to begin with, that he had been bullied for so long that he needed any way for someone else to be their target instead. This eventually leads to the two of them arguing and then suddenly Tom fell backwards and off of the roof. Helen was stunned, the sound of Tom's body hitting the pavement echoing in his mind as the police would come to question Helen. With both of them and many of the school assuming Tom committed exit the game, though there were those that thought Helen might have pushed Tom off as well. That night, Helen cried for hours. The guilt was too much to bear until a thought entered his mind that it wasn't his fault. And furthermore, Tom was a bad person, a piece of shit that got what he deserved. And that maybe, maybe it's time others got what they deserved as well. This leads into Helen donning a mask and going to kill Judy and her friend Maggie and everyone else in the school dorm for that matter. Quote, that night, all the students who were in the dorm were murdered. No one knows how that killer did it. The murderer used the victim's blood to paint on the walls of the dorm, with most of the paintings being smiley faces. Many of the corpses were being chopped and mashed, possibly to get their pigments. Helen Otis, the culprit, is still missing currently." Unquote. And that's pretty much the story of the original Bloody Painter. This one's kind of strange because for a while the story was actually pretty good, all things considered. I like that he gets bullied and doesn't immediately reach from within to overpower them. I like how it's sort of left a little ambiguous if he really meant to push Tom off the roof or if it was an accident, or maybe a little bit of both. But then when he goes and kills an entire dorm full of people without anyone hearing the screams, overpowers them all, paints the walls with their blood, it feels like we kind of jumped so far it collectively pulled everyone's back out of shape. I think it might have worked a little bit better if he only killed a couple of people and left it at that. Then again, if it was more realistic and he had a gun, maybe it would kind of make sense. But then it also asks the question, how did no one hear it? You know, wh where was everybody? How did he manage to do that much damage and everyone in the dorm? No one was able to escape. It's, it's something that needs some explanation to say the least. I do like, however, that the story does acknowledge how no one knows how he managed to pull this off, as if to say, yeah, there's no way this could really happen, but it did. But there are far worse stories of this kind, so besides that, I'd say it's a fair bit better than the others we've read like this so far. All the same though, the next part of this story is titled Bloody Painter on the Snow, which is a short prequel to this one, again created back in 2013. But this one is actually very short and seems to have gone under the radar as well, with most big creepypasta channels never even having read this one. The story takes place back whenever Helen was only 10 years old, and he has a friend named Phil who has an abusive father. Well, to make a short story even shorter, it's a snowy day and some bullies are teasing Phil. They throw a snowball at him, but this one has a rock in it and it bashes over Phil's head and he dies right then and there. The bullies try to cover it up by covering him in snow, but then later when Helen is looking for his friend, he finds his corpse out in the blood-soaked snow. The bullies then try to pin the blame on Helen. When the police get involved and then all the kids at school and in the area thinks Helen is a murderer, eventually an eyewitness comes out and testifies that it was the bullies that did it and not Helen. Helen's mom was happy about this and of course asks if Helen would like to go meet the boy who saved his life from prison so that they may become new friends. But Helen is done having friends it seems. He's still in pain from losing Phil, and so instead he goes into the comfort of drawing in his books. The eyewitness, however, was actually Tom from the first story. And that's the story. And honestly, it's 
very, very simple. Uh, but the whole twist of the eyewitness being Tom, who would later, four years later in fact, try to pin the blame of a stolen watch on Helen seems kind of like a weak way of connecting it to the first story, when actually, I sort of like the whole theme of Helen being blamed for things that he didn't actually do as a connecting piece instead. It's already there, but the Tom twist kind of uh, deflates that a bit. But with that said, we have one more Bloody Painter story to read. This one being made in 2017, and seems to be the story the author pushes towards the forefront, with it being the longest of the three, it being called the original story, and the others now being called prequels, which is a little bit confusing and it's not how that works, but whatever. And this one also has an animatic version on Delucat's YouTube channel, which all the footage in the background obviously is from that. So all things considered, this is like one of the highest production value creepypastas that I've ever seen from an individual before going in. But is it any good? Well, yeah. Yeah, this one's actually pretty good. The story follows the events after the killing spree Helen went on in the school dorms, and he's now in a psych ward, but seems to be very quiet and doesn't remember what happened that night. His doctor slowly gets more info out of him over a few years, however, and learns more about Helen's past, like why his name is Helen. You see, his parents had a hard time conceiving a child, and they really wanted a girl. So when they had a newborn baby boy, they decided to raise him as a little girl, fucking with his brain from a young age until they suddenly made him dress like a boy when he started going to school out of fear of what others might think of them, realizing their mistake, I suppose. This further adds to the narrative that Helen always is being gaslit, pinned down as someone that he's not, a thief, a murderer, even a girl. His life is full of this sort of stuff, it would seem. Well, eventually the doctor and Helen grow rather close, almost like friends, and Helen was always on his best behavior, stayed out of trouble, and eventually the doctor almost saw Helen as a sort of son that he never had, and he guided him towards rehabilitation. Though the mystery of what happened that night in the dorm stayed a mystery. With the high body count of 17, many wondered if it was even possible for one boy to do all of that, and this actually helped in his case of being released later on, which I thought was rather clever since that was one of the most unrealistic aspects of the original story. It's now being turned on its head, the illogical now being looked through a logical lens. A few years pass and Helen is now a functioning member of society, dressed in a nice suit, a gentleman, all things considered, and the doctor couldn't be more proud. Well, that is until 2003, October. There, some missing persons cases with no connecting pieces to them. That was until it was discovered that all the victims were all in the same class with Helen Otis before he entered the hospital. His house was searched and the police were quickly met with dead bodies, upside down corpses facing them like a butcher shop but each was also connected to a canvas with paintings made of their own blood. The doctor fell into despair. He couldn't believe that the boy he helped rehabilitate, who seemed like he was truly misunderstood, was nothing but a monster. One that he couldn't, maybe no one, could have helped or can stop now. What's more is there was a letter addressed to him at the crime scene that read as follows. Quote, Dear Doctor, I finally remember what happened that night after I looked at my mask. That night seven years ago, the day before Halloween, I kept fidgeting on my bed, unable to sleep. All of the things that happened to me stung my mind like needles. That time I thought to myself, I had to do something about it. And then it happened. I threw a turned-on hair dryer into the public bathtub. <laughs> there were a lot of people present. I remembered I used a simple fork to dig someone's eyes out. I remembered I ripped someone's head from their neck. <laughs> I attacked everyone who lived in the student dorm. I can't fully remember all the details. I just did what my mind told me to do. When no one was screaming or struggling anymore, Peace fell upon me, a peaceful feeling I never felt before. I fell to my well-deserved slumber on a pile of blood.
bloody bodies. When I opened my eyes again, I saw you, Doc. You said that the reason I am here is because I am sick. Well, I must be pretty ill for now, but I never felt so peaceful in my life. Maybe I'm better off to be sick like this. You told me that the next time we meet is on the electric chair. Well, what if it was the other way around? You must know that I have my own way to meet you in person. I'll see you soon. Unquote. It was then that the doctor knew he was never his friend. He was his prey, playing with his food, even in the hospital. It's then, after the doctor understands the severity of his situation, he hears his house's door open, his fate ultimately sealed. And that's the story, the whole story, of The Bloody Painter. And overall, I'd say it was one of the best of these killer OC types of stories that I've ever read. Is it perfect? No. But considering the competition, this is actually a pretty fun and a mostly tightly structured story. And while most of these OC killer stories seem to just be weird wish fulfillment, this one actually seems more like a slasher film. Kind of like a combination between Halloween, Sleepaway Camp, and maybe just a little bit of the unusual suspects. Oh, and random fact, did you know that the author of this creepypasta is now a VTuber? So, you know, that's pretty cool, I suppose. But with that out of the way, let's get a few more uh, non-killer OC-related stories, shall we? The Dating Game. I remember this one being quite highly rated at the time when it first came out, and it starts off with the following paragraph. Quote, I've been single for a while, and I was sick and tired of it. Being 32 and single is no laughing matter. The traumatic experiences of watching your friends get married, have children, and attain the American dream are akin to the hopeless depression of the schizophrenic mental patient. I wanted a wife. I wanted kids. I wanted a steady job. I was tired of working at Burger King and living alone in a studio apartment. I was almost certain I memorized 90% of porn stars on the internet by name. Disgusted by the company of my left hand, I decided to go out to one of those speed dating events." Unquote. And so he does just that. And after quite a few misses at the speed dating event, he then meets a special someone. Quote, the woman I met at the next table was the most interesting of all, but not in a bad way. She had long, flowing dark hair and green eyes. She had this cute smile, and man, what a tight body on this one. Black dress, black shoes, black everything. For someone dressed in such a gothic manner, she had such a bubbly personality. Everything I said made her giggle, and I felt like a king just talking to this girl. She was 27 and currently unemployed. She was married to a husband before, but he had left her after their two children had died of leukemia. She told me that the cancer was entwined with her lineage, dating back as far as the 18th century. Therefore, in numerous fits of emotional rage, her ex-husband blamed her for giving the children cancer and left. Too pained by the loss of her entire family, she moved to the city a few weeks ago and was living on unemployment. Unable to continue working at her job due to the crippling depression and panic she suffered as a result of her abandonment. Despite the torment of her life, she never seemed depressed about it. Either she was incredibly optimistic at life, or she was one of the best actors I had ever seen. Either way, I was willing to take a shot." Unquote. And so he does just that, and the two end up going on a few dates, their first being at a pool hall, which she seems to be very good at. Every time she giggled, he falls deeper and deeper in love with her. Weeks and months passed on, and after about seven months of dating, our narrator pops the question. She excitingly screamed yes, and the two began to really start their life together, starting with him moving out of his shitty apartment and into her lovely ranch house. But that's when something weird occurred. Quote, As I was moving my final things in, I noticed how much of a mess I was making. With my boxes of stuff and all, I apologized and motioned to the basement to finish moving my things. Her face instantly darted to mine. In a hurried and almost frantic voice, she assured me that she'd take care of the rest of my things, and that I should relax. It was a bit odd, sure, but she had been through so much excruciating sadness throughout her life, 
that her having a psychiatric illness is something I expected. I complied with her request, unquote. After this, another few months pass, and the two have their wedding day and honeymoon. But that damn basement was the only thing. They'd already gotten into a few smaller arguments about it, but it was the only blemish on an otherwise lovely relationship. That is, until, as the narrator puts it, everything he knew about his life shattered. Quote, One day, she told me she was going to the grocery store. I noted that I wanted some ground beef in order to make hamburgers for dinner. She smiled at me with that cute, adorable smile I had grown to know and love and headed out. After climbing Burger King's corporate ladder, I had finally attained the position of regional financial manager for the entire state. I was working on some budget information, assessing the costs of all the franchises across the state. It was a long and arduous process, but I was getting just about six figures for it, so I wasn't complaining. After each report was fully completed and evaluated, I moved the files to a USB drive so I could upload them to a computer for a corporate meeting the next day. To my horror, with only three reports left to finish, the computer crashed. If I didn't finish these reports, I would surely lose my job. I called my wife, asking if she had another computer or something I could use, but she didn't answer. I rummaged through the house to find something to finish these reports with no avail. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so I took a daring risk of approaching the basement. The handle was unusually cold and the door was locked. Frustrated and defeated, I slumped on the couch in a depression. That is, until I realized that there was a specific flower pot that my wife always guarded with her life. On a hunch, I went over to it and found that key at the bottom of the pot, under the dirt. As soon as I opened the door, a rancid and tangible odor attacked me like a falling wall from a decrepit building. The entire basement looked as if it was wasting away. A clear contrast to the rest of the house. The heavy layers of dust upon on every surface suggested that the basement hadn't been accessed in years. Using my cell phone as a flashlight, I guided myself down the stairs and flicked a light switch. Surprisingly, the bulb still worked. The walls looked molded, the wood was breaking down, the stench was putrid, and the entire place was in disarray. I encountered a strong sense of dysphoria after setting foot in the room, so I quickly searched for some old computer with the intent of running upstairs as quickly as as possible. To my luck and astonishment, there was an old laptop and charger in the corner, hidden under some boxes and books. Oddly enough, one of the boxes was one which she brought down after I had first moved in. I had not seen some of this stuff in a long time. Ignoring the nostalgia, I seized the computer and charger and raced up to the master bedroom. After giving the laptop a few minutes to power, I booted it up. It ran on Windows XP and was quite the technological dinosaur compared to modern equipment. But it had Microsoft Office, so it was acceptable. As soon as Windows finished booting up, a system message appeared on the screen, notifying me that new sources had been added to the tagged video cache, and if I'd like to check it. I had never seen a system message like this before. I know that snooping is generally taboo, but curiosity overcame me. I was taken to a hidden file that required a password to access it. Rolling my eyes, I moved the cursor to the X out of the program when suddenly something typed the password in for me. A bit frightened at this point, I was sucked into the screen. There were four videos entitled him.avi, one.avi, two.avi, and y.avi. All four thumbnails were pure black. Curious, I clicked on the file entitled him.avi. I should have never done that." Unquote. What he saw in those videos was purely, simply evil. The first being a man being tortured and eventually killed by her, his own wife. The second being a young boy suffering the same fate and being burned alive. And the third, being a baby. A baby being injected with some sort of acid that slowly melted it all away. The cries from all three videos is enough to have our narrator break down, and in all the videos was this sick, evil giggle that turned into what he could only describe as demonic by the third video. Then, there was the new video, freshly uploaded to the computer. Quote, Shaking, I forced myself to click on Y.AVI. 
before the video played, I noticed that this file was modified within the last hour. Almost blinded by fear, I swallowed my apprehension and opened my eyes. This time, there was just the woman. No other person was present. She was facing away from the camera and was speaking in a demonic tone. I can't recall exactly, but here's a paraphrased transcript of what she said. Hello. Clearly by now, you know that I'm not the person you thought I was. I'm a sick and twisted woman. I love this. It makes me so happy to see somebody die, especially at my hand. I know you're watching this, and I know you're terrified. The ghosts of those things I have killed are swarming around you right now, telling you to pull away from the screen to save yourself. Yet you still sit there and watch, waiting for some happy ending or reasonable explanation as to the events you have just witnessed. There are no special effects here, what you saw was real. I love watching this footage, even so much as to pleasure myself to it, but I can't hide it. You couldn't know, your lonely piece of shit brain, tell you to turn me in. You were so desperate for love, you fell in love with a serial killer." Unquote. His wife, the love of his life, didn't lose her husband by him abandoning her. She murdered him, and worse, her two children, baby, destroyed mercilessly by their own mother. She then buried their remains under the cement of the basement floor, thus the smell. Before long, it's eventually revealed that she's in the same room with him as he watches the video, and from there, he blacked out. The neighbors heard screams from the house and called the police. He was lucky enough to come out of this whole thing alive. And what's more is his wife received the death penalty when she was tried. She giggled as it apparently took four lethal injections to take her out. She cursed her husband, telling him that he'd have to live his life in fear, for she'll find some way to finish the job before finally dying. The story ends with our narrator doing well for himself, but implying that through some sorcery, that she might be alive again and after him or something. And that's the dating game. And while I think the actual last, very, very last part of this, of her somehow still being alive, is a little bit dumb with her being so hard to kill and maybe coming back somehow, I do think overall the story is quite creepy. Although I suppose it is mostly through shock value and just how fucked up those videos are on her computer. Truly some horrifying imagery is painted through those videos descriptions. But overall it's a pretty good pasta. The Wyoming Incident. Now this one's a little bit to unpack, but to start, let's read the very short creepypasta connected with it. Quote, The Wyoming Incident, or the Wyoming Hijacking, is a lesser known case of television broadcasting, hijacking slash hacking. A hacker managed to interrupt broadcasts from a local programming channel, believed to serve several smaller communities in the county of Neobarara and aired his slash her own video. The video contained numerous clips of disembodied human heads showing various emotions and poses. The camera positions changed often, usually every 10 to 15 seconds, and the video was often interrupted by a special presentation announcement. This clip is taken from one of these intervals.
The video is mostly locally well known and would probably not even be that popular if it were not for the effects it had on the few residents who watched it for an extended period of time. Complaints included vomiting, hallucinations, headaches, etc. While some believed it was paranormal, specialists had determined that the cause of these afflictions were frequencies played regularly throughout the broadcast. In this clip, the frequency being played is somewhere between 17 and 19 hertz. This range of frequency, when played for long periods of time, causes eyeballs to subtly vibrate, sometimes inducing visual hallucinations. This video is significant in that it is one of the most recent television hijackings. Such actions were rare even in the 80s. A search for the Chicago Max Headroom incident as an example, and are even more rare today. The hacker has not yet been caught, and all attempts to trace the video have proven futile." Unquote. Now what's interesting about this creepypasta is that it's actually part of an ARG that began back in 2006 and is considered one of the very first horror-based ARGs ever conceived. I talked about this a bit on my YouTube iceberg as well, uh, but it's connected with this video I've been playing in the background. The ARG is well known for being one of the oldest ones as well, over 17 years old at this point in fact, and most of the story associated with it takes place on a forum called The Happy Cube. YouTuber Nightmind has covered this ARG across three rather long videos, and it's a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, but to put it lightly, even if it's a very old ARG, it also seems uh, to lack any real focus and is kind of a fucking mess to try to document in any meaningful way. At any rate though, the original hoax hijacking video remains the most interesting part of this whole ARG in my opinion, as something truly unnerving to watch late at night. But besides the video and, again, the fact that it's 17 years old, uh, there's not really much to talk about here. So, moving on. Gregory's Room. Like the last one, this one isn't really a creepypasta, and more so a video connected with a very interesting channel. I'll play the video quickly in full here since it's only a minute long. Oh, I didn't see you there. Hello, I'm Gregory, and this is my room. We're going to have so much fun together, just the two of us. We can look at the stars together. We can read a book together. We can stare into the glorious flames of the fireplace together. But no matter what we do it will just be the two of us, alone in this room. Just me and you, no parents, no police, no one can hear you. Embrace me. I need love. Gregory need love. The description to this video reads, quote, The above is a rare clip from the 1999 Nick Jr. pilot titled Gregory's Room. The show was ultimately rejected due to a poor focus group test results, unquote. Now obviously this is fake, but this whole channel, Seinfeld's Spitstain, is pretty well known for some crazy fucking videos, usually connected with Nickelodeon and the series in particular, Jimmy Neutron. Here is a few choice examples. Hello Jimmy, hello you. I am going to make a delicious dinner meal. Jimmy, your mom is dead. Do an order of pizza for dinner. Okay, Danny. 
Hello can I get a large pizza pie for the Nutrin household? Now it is time for father-son bonding. Bond with me Jimmy. Hi, friends! Okay. Uh, no one's more about Yelko. When the fourth round you call in the... Here's your pizza. The pizza is aggressive. Oh shit. Just another day in the life of Jimmy Nutrin. What's interesting about this channel in particular, besides the odd videos, is that it hasn't uploaded in 7 years. And what's more, is the last video they ever uploaded not only connects all his older videos together in a sort of shared universe of creation, but it also gets extremely meta by showing the supposed creator of the channel, a man in a completely white void, with Pixar rejection letters and failed Nick Jr. pilots surrounding his desk. The video that he created in the video was a screwdriver destroying all his channel's past creations, from Gregory to Jimmy Nutron and so on. And then a message comes up on his computer screen that says, quit while you're ahead. And then, well, he does, and he ends himself. Only then to be picked up and carried away by God, or uh, Hugh from Jimmy Neutron. Free of his pain and failures, his desk full of his creations left behind. We then see a picture of Jerry Seinfeld, all while the song titled Summer Teeth by Wilco plays in the background. A song about living all alone, a man going to work so he can eat, and then one day die. And there are also lyrics about committing exit the game of life in the summer as well. Now, some have actually come to think that the creator of this channel made this video not only as a final look behind the curtain and goodbye, but as sort of an ending of life message, if you catch my drift. While anything is possible, and that would truly be tragic, I feel like maybe the video is about a creative man who failed being able to achieve his dreams, at being an animator, or maybe did at one point and was eventually fired, something like that, and was never able to pick up work again. So he turned to YouTube to create these sort of jokes, shit post type animations, and they got him very popular and earned him a very sizable audience but he still wasn't happy, and so decides to stop while he's ahead, leaving that channel there as an immortal legacy while he moves on to the next era of his life, killing the channel in the burst of one last creation. But who knows for sure? It's really hard to say, but it definitely is a very interesting video to end the channel out on, and is a channel in general that I'd highly recommend you go give a watch sometime if you haven't already. And finally, for our final story this tier, quote, Man and girl go out to drive under moonlight. They stop at on at a side of road. He turns to his girl and say, Baby, I love you very much. What is it, honey? Our car is broken down. I think the engine is broken. I'll walk and get some more fuel. Okay, I'll stay here and look after our stereo. There have been news report of steris being stolen. 
good idea. Keep the doors locked no matter what. I love you, sweaty. So the guy left to get full for the car. After two hours, the girls say, where is my baby? He is supposed to be back by now. Then the girl hear a scratching sound and a voice say, let me in. The girl doesn't do it and then after a while she goes to sleep. The next morning, she wakes up and finds her boyfriend still not there. She gets out to check and... Man. Door. Hand. Hook. Car. Door. Unquote. Okay, so... Obviously, that was another meme creepypasta. And while it truly is a literary masterpiece, let's do one more serious pasta this tier. Tulpa. Ending this tier out, we have one more bonus entry, and one of my favorites at that. Tulpa begins with the following. Quote, Last year, I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money. And since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me all I would have to do is stay in a room, alone with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough, and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day, I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed, then attached sensors to my head and hooked them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double again and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualize my double moving around, or trying to interact with him, and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room." Unquote. From there, our protagonist tries his best to imagine his double, but has a hard time keeping focused on having him there for very long, up until the fourth day when he's finally able to keep him present for the whole six hours. By the second week, they gave him a different room, with wall-mounted speakers that would play discordant, ugly, and unsettling music and sounds to see if he can manage to keep focused on the tulpa being around despite the distracting stimuli. He managed to do just that over the next two weeks. Uh, by the time he had been doing this for a month, he started to get bored though. So to liven things up, he actually started interacting with his doppelganger. He'd start having conversations with it. Imagine him juggling, play rock, paper, scissors, etc. When he asked if his tomfoolery would have adverse effects on the study, he was instead encouraged to continue doing so. But then, something kind of strange happened. Quote, I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I'd said my date was wearing a yellow top, and he told me it was a green one. I thought about it for a second and realized that he was right. It creeped me out, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I once read, years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. That was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd to not see him. So, whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. Eventually, I started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with my friends, or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him. So, I was able to carry out full conversations with him and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I had forgotten, he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. 
He had an uncanny grasp of the minutia of body language that I didn't even realize I was picking up on. For example, I thought the date I brought him along long was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and leaning towards me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle cues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened and, well, let's just say that date went very well." Unquote. Our protagonist goes on to note that by four months, his tulpa was with him everywhere at all times. However, at some point, he starts to withdraw from the world a little bit. You see, he was having trouble relating with other people. They all seemed so confused and unsure of themselves, while he had a manifestation of himself to confer with. While others wouldn't understand their own feelings, he understood not only his own, but those around him, or at least his tulpa did. Eventually, this leads to a friend of him confronting him. Quote, He pounded at the door until I answered it, and came in fuming and swearing up a storm. You haven't answered when I called you in fucking weeks, you dick! He yelled. What's your fucking problem? I was about to apologize to him, and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night, but my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him it said, and before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break, he fell to the floor and came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious than I had ever been, and I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground and gave him two savage kicks to the ribs, and that was when he fled, hunched over and sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later, but I told them that he had been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off with a warning. My tulpa was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crowing about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who'd grown furious, not me. I'd been feeling guilty and a little ashamed, but he'd goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, and knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me, and I felt my skin crawl." Unquote. When he tried to explain this to the researchers, they laughed it off, that you can't be scared of something you're imagining, and though he tries to take their words to heart, it's difficult to make his tulpa go away. It's automatic at this point, and he now needs to actively concentrate to make him go away. What's worse is he is slowly changing. His eyes twinkled with mischief. There was malice in his now constant smile. His skin grew ever more ashen, teeth more pointed. That discordant music from before now followed him as if it were a calling card to his tulpa. He continued to visit the research center for some time. He needed the money after all, but now he was actively trying not to visualize him. He assumed they had no way of knowing he was lying to them now, but he was very wrong, as at one point he is then grabbed up by two impressive men and injected with something that knocked him out. When he awoke, he was restrained to a bed, and none of the researchers would speak to him answer any of his questions. They simply force feed him pills and injected him with stuff that made his head feel fuzzy and made the tulpa seemingly ever present. He was now worse than ever before, looking more like a demon than a man. It actively mocked him now, played with his head and at times it seemed like the doctors were actually talking to his tulpa rather than him, almost as if he was the doppelganger, but didn't know if that too was just an illusion, the drugs, the tulpa, or what the hell was going on. The following is the conclusion to this tale, since I think it's best done justice through its own words. Quote, Another thing that I pray was a delusion. He could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me, poke and prod at me if he felt I wasn't paying enough attention to him. Once he grabbed my testicles and squeezed until I told him I loved him. Another time, he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days, I can convince myself that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister, he paused. A querulous look crossed his face. 
and reached down and touched my head, like my mother used to do when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment and then smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. Then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and passed out. I awoke unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and found it unlocked. I walked out into the empty hallway and then ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. There, I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't remember how. I locked the door and shoved a dresser against it. Took a long shower and slept for a day and a half. Nobody came for me in the night, and nobody came the next day. The one after that, it was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room, but it felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had even known I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research center was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I recovered as much as one can. I don't leave the house much. And I have panic attacks when I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much. And my nightmares are terrible. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I used the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. It works. Sometimes. Not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There's been a tragedy. My sister is the latest victim in a spree of killings, the police say. Their perpetrator mugs his victims, then guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely as a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant, unsettling stuff. That sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still. A little louder now. Unquote. And that's the tale of Tulpa, and there is something about this one that just naturally is interesting. The idea of the Tulpa is actually a concept in uh, theosopathy, uh, mysticism, and the paranormal. The theory being the idea that one can will another being into existence through imagining them long enough. What's more is these beings can be independent of their creator, and in case you were wondering, yes, this would be an explanation to imaginary friends. In fact, it could be theorized that children are less restrictive with their imagination, and could theoretically do this without much thought. It is, of course, just a theory, but I also like how it was used here, as it relates to the subconscious. Our protagonist's doppelganger seemingly being a dark shadow of themselves, the shadow of their persona. It's all very Jungian, and it is also really interesting and unique uh, for a horror story premise like this. This one's just a great story, period, and will always stick out in my mind as one of the most creative in the scene. And that is it for this tier of the creepy pasta iceberg. It's hard to believe guys, but we're actually getting really close to finishing this iceberg after all this time. There's only two more tiers to go, and so there's probably gonna be two more videos as a result, because as you can see from this video, I just love adding in other new stories that weren't on the original iceberg, and well, I'm just passionate about this topic, so let's take our time. But all the same, there is going to be two more parts, and there may be some sort of special surprise for the last one that I'll save for later. But as a small hint, it just might involve you lovely viewers. And speaking of lovely viewers, I want to make sure to give a big thanks to all my Patreons over on Patreon. With special thanks out to all my great night owls, Macabre Kaiju, Ho Hot, and Medusa's Hex, and my Arch Owl Zen Garden Party. Because of viewers and supporters like you guys, this channel is really going somewhere good. In fact, we're getting extremely close to 50,000 subscribers, something which is blowing my mind still that it's so close at this point. We'll have to do something special for that occasion. 
But at any rate, if you also want to support the channel financially, be sure to check out my Patreon down below. And also follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you want to see more updates and news regarding future videos, as well as random memes and the like, or if you just wish to DM me and chat. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.